Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geocenta Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDUP and ESCCP. Today's event will consist of a brief overview of the two programs by Dr. Andrea Leeson, followed by the technical portion of the webinar on novel approaches to remove PFAS from investigation-derived waste. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Brian Chaplin of the University of Illinois will discuss his research to develop a reactive electrochemical membrane technology for the oxidation of PFAS in groundwater under different operational modes and solution conditions. Brian's presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. After this, we will uh, move on to Dr. Thomas Holson of Clarkson University, who will summarize his research results on soil washing of inve investigation-derived waste with a combination of water, methanol, and sodium chloride, followed by treatment of the resulting solution in a plasma-based reactor to destroy desorbed PFAS. Dom's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session with both of our speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and also provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you cannot download Zoom, you may view the slides using a compatible internet browser, such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you have technical difficulties or if your screen freezes, try keying Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here and use the webinar ID provided to you. You may also submit a comment using the chat box, but please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties because the Q&A option should be reserved for questions for the speakers. And in case of continued difficulties, just download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line. We will also be live streaming the webinar on the CERDIP and ESCCP YouTube channel at the link shown here. So that's an additional option for following today's webinar. The broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box that we referenced uh, on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. Just go ahead, please, and submit them as you think of them in advance of the Q&A session. And when you submit your questions, we would appreciate it if you can add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you uh, when we relay the questions to the speakers. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson, who is the Deputy Director of CERDUP and ESCCP and also the Program Manager for the Environmental Restoration Program area, which is the subject of today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Leeson has been with CERDUP and ESTCP since 2001, and before that, she served as a research leader at the Battelle Memorial Institute, where she conducted scientific research on in-situ bioremediation and the design and implementation of innovative biological, chemical, and physical treatment technologies for site remediation and industrial wastewater. Andrea received her doctoral degree in environmental engineering from the Johns Hopkins University. Andrea, please proceed. Thank you, Rula, and thank you everyone for joining us here today on this webinar. Before we get into our technical talks, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview about who we are and how these webinars today fit into what we're doing. So we have two companion programs. The first is CERDIP, the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. And this is traditionally a research and development program. We partner with 
the DOD, DOE, and EPA in this. And we are really developing fundamental research to impact real world environmental management. ESTCP is our Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. And this is where we conduct the demonstration and validation of the knowledge and the technologies that come out of CERTIP. And our goal here ultimately is to transition these technologies out of the lab into the field. We establish the cost and the performance of the technologies. And it's very important to us as well to, to transfer the technology to the end users. We have a couple or several different environmental drivers that dictate what we fund over the years. Uh, this first one is in sustaining our ranges, facilities, and operations. As you can imagine, this covers a very broad array of topics from maritime sustainability to forward operating bases, noise issues, air emissions, UXO munitions constituents, et cetera. And then we also are driven to reduce current and future liability. Now, what falls under here are some of the pollution prevention issues, um, elimination of hazardous materials or processes at our installations. And then we're also dealing with um, issues from past practices, some of these legacy uh, chemicals in groundwater soils and sediments. And what I'd like to talk about a little bit here is what we're doing on PFAS specifically. And as you're here on the webinar, you realize this has been a, an emerging issue over the last several years. Um, the website for this resource that I'm going to talk about, if it's not already in the chat line, we're going to copy that over so you can take a look at that. And what this graph is showing you is everything that CERTIP and ESTCP is doing on the issue of PFAS, whether um, in the environment, as well as developing PFAS-free alternatives to aqueous film-forming foam. You can find this graphic on our website listed here. And this is an interactive graphic. So each of these boxes, if you click on it, will give you more information about the different types of projects that have been funded under all these different areas. So these areas cover everything from the fate and transport of PFAS to treatment technologies, ecotoxicity, as well as analytical and sampling methodologies. As I said before, our tech transfer is very important to us to get these technologies out to the end users. We have a variety of different methods that we use to transfer the technologies from different videos. You can find these on YouTube as well as embedded in our website. We do in-person trainings, guidances, manuals. And then of course we have this webinar series here. Listed here are a number of the webinars that are coming up over the next few months. And you can see here that we will have a webinar on PFAS both in June and July and as well as later in the year. You can register for these webinars at the CERTIP and ESTCP website. And it's listed here. At this point, let me turn it back to you, Rula. Thank you, Andrea. And we did provide a link to the um, web page that Andrea referenced in the chat box. And of course, you can download the slides and it's a interactive link and uh, you can access it from the uh, PDF. At this point, I would go, like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Brian Chaplin, who is an Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, Brian's research is focused on novel electrochemical and catalytic, catalytic processes for water treatment with an emphasis on developing technologies that promote water sustainability. Uh, Brian is the recipient of the 2015 National Science Foundation Early Career Development Award, the 2019 Environmental Science and Technology Early Career Scientist Award and the 2018 Environmental Science and Technology Best Paper Award in the area of environmental technology. He holds a bachelor's and a master's degree uh, from the University of Minnesota, and his doctoral degree is from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in environmental engineering. Brian, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Rula, very much for the introduction, and I'm very honored to have the opportunity to discuss with you my research 
that is focused on electrochemical oxidation of PFAS using a novel technology that we are developing in our laboratories, which we call reactive electrochemical membranes. So I'll begin with an overview of the agenda for this talk. First, I will identify the problem statement, then give a brief description of the reactive electrochemical membrane technology. I will then discuss the primary technical objectives, then go into the highlights of the key electrochemical oxidation results, and then wrap up with conclusions as well as benefits to DOD. So within the larger context, PFAS has been recognized as an environmental concern due to their abundance, stability, and toxicity at very low levels. And as a result, the US EPA has set health advisory levels for the two most common PFAS, PFOA and PFOS, at a combined concentration of less than 70 nanograms per liter. Several states have been even more proactive and have set even lower limits for these PFAS. PFAS are a concern at DOD sites because they are contained in aqueous stone-forming foams, um, which are used extensively for firefighting applications. And as a result, these PFAS compounds have migrated into the groundwater. And in some cases, these contaminated plumes have migrated off-site where they have the potential to enter public drinking water supply. The combination of their resistance to traditional treatment processes and the very low treatment goals set for PFAS make them a very difficult class of compounds to treat. So in order to illustrate the difficulty of treating PFAS using destructive chemical methods, I have calculated the reduction potentials for both the direct oxidation and the direct reduction of PFOA and PFOS. And then I utilize this data to construct a simple activation energy versus electrode potential diagram. And that's shown on the left. So activation energy is inversely proportional to the reaction rate constant. So lower activation energies correspond to faster rates. As a point of reference, I have this horizontal line shown at 40 kilojoules per mole. And this represents uh, approximately the limit at which uh, observable reactivity can occur. So using PFOS as an example, we have to go to more negative potentials than minus two volts or more positive potentials than three volts in order to get reactivity. The vertical lines here represent the redox potentials for the aqueous electron, as well as the hydroxyl radical. And these approximately bracket the a range of redox potentials that we can achieve uh, with modern technologies. Uh, however, recent uh, research has shown that electrochemical oxidation is a potential strategy for PFAS remediation. And the reason for that is we can polarize an electron to higher than this three volt range and are able to then achieve direct oxidation of these PFAS compounds. So the graph on the right here, this shows the potential windows for different electrode materials. And this simply means the potentials at which hydrogen evolution occur and oxygen evolution occur. So as you move up in this graph, we look at platinum, we go to carbon, and then we have this class of electrodes that I'm calling EAOP electrodes. And this, these are known as electrochemical advanced oxidation process electrodes. And so what we really want in an electrode material for electrochemical oxidation is a high over potential for oxygen evolution. And that allows the electrode to participate in direct oxidation of PFAS and not significant oxidation of water. So once you have an appropriate anode material, you can achieve complete mineralization of these PFAS compounds through a two-step process. So various studies have shown that PFAS are unreactive with hydroxyl radicals. However, if the PFAS compound, using PFAS here as an example, first undergoes a direct oxidation at the electrode surface to form this radical species, that activates that compound and then allows it to be reactive with the hydroxyl radicals that are also generated on the electrode surface. So this two-step process can uh, continue and eventually can result in complete mineralization of these compounds. And for PFAS, that would mean the production of sulfate, fluoride, as well as CO2. The REM technology that we have developed utilizes a TI-407 EAOP electrode material, 
which is a reduced form of TiO2. We have fabricated this as a microporous ceramic membrane where it functions as both a membrane and an electrode. We operate the REM in flow through mode, which simply means we are forcing the PFAS contaminated water through the membrane pores. This approach has two primary advantages with respect to PFAS treatment. First, we are able to take advantage of the large internal surface area of the REM for reaction. And second, the small micron sized pores significantly enhance the mass transport. So that brings me to the technical objectives. We have three specific uh, technical objectives of this work. The first is to develop REMs for destructive PFAS removal to below the 70 nanogram per liter treatment goal. The second is to determine the optimal operational mode. And lastly is the calculation of the energy requirements for this REM based system. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about the REM synthesis. These REMs can be synthesized by the reduction of non-conductive TiO2 to a conducted and in our laboratories, we fabricate both tubular as well as disc REMs. So the image on the left is showing the conversion of a TiO2 ceramic membrane precursor to a Ti407 membrane. And so this is accomplished at a high temperature in a reductive environment. Uh, the image on the right is showing our creation of our pellets. This is produced by first making the Ti407 powder and then forming them in the shape of these pellets. So for this work, I'm going to, uh, everything I'm presenting in this work will utilize these pellets. This provides a low surface, or a small reactor that we can then develop proof of concept that the REM technology is appropriate for PFAS treatment. So this represents our REM flow through reactor that we're using in this study. So we have a feed solution. This feed solution is circulated in this outer loop. We have a pressure gauge and regulator here where we can control the back pressure. And so the higher the back pressure, the more flux we get through our REM. And the exploded view here on this graph shows our TI-407 pellet, which is our anode. We have a stainless steel counter electrode and a reference electrode that we place near the pellet in order to monitor the potential. So in this study, we've tested a, a few different variables. We tested the effect of both potential and flow rate on PFAS removal. And we've also tested the operational mode. So we have two different operational modes, single pass and recycle mode. The figure here is, is showing the single pass mode. So we're just looking at the conversion of PFAS in a single pass through the REM. The recycle mode, uh, we would then take this permeate and recycle it to the feed. And we continue to recycle that solution until we achieve the desired treatment goal. So the first results are the results of effective potential. So we start with synthetic solutions containing PFOA and PFOF. We have initial concentrations of 10 micromolar in a potassium phosphate background electrolyte at a neutral pH. And our flux is 240 liters per meter squared per hour. And this is typical uh, way to report flux for membrane units. And those of you who are familiar with membranes will recognize that this flux is in the range of microfiltration and ultrafiltration membranes. So the figure on the left is showing our normalized permeate concentration as a function of potential. And as you can see, as you increase the potential to greater than two volts, we begin to see removal of both of these compounds. And at the highest potentials tested, we were able to oxidize both PFOA and PFOS to below our detection limits. So for PFOA, we were able to achieve less than 86 nanograms per liter at 3.3 volts, and for PFOS, less than 35 nanograms per liter at 3.6 volts. So we observed very few problems. However, we did detect, which is shown on the right, PFHEPA, which is one carbon atom shorter than PFOA. And we see that this concentration peaks at about two and a half volts, but at the highest potential tested, it is also below our detection limit. So we attempted to uh, complete a fluorine mass balance for these experiments. And so 
the mass balance for PFOA is shown on the left and PFOF on the right. Um, as we go to higher potentials, we see the mass balance is less than 100%. So although we're not detecting uh, very many products in these experiments, these results suggest that we are forming some intermediates that either were not detected by the LCMS or some of these very short chain PFOS could be vol volatile and could volatilize from solution. So future work will focus on trying to complete this mass balance. We also looked at the effect of flux in the REM system. And so we did this at, under the same solution conditions as the prior experiments. Uh, we had a constant potential in this case of 2.9 volts. And we varied our flux from 36 LMH all the way up to almost 1,000 LMH. And so at the lowest flux that we tested, we were able to oxidize both PFOA and PFOS to less than our detection limits. And this corresponds to approximately a five log removal. And so under these conditions, our residence time within our REM is about 75 seconds. So we're also able to take the data on the left and calculate rates of removal, which is shown on the right. And we see from this data that our maximum rates were achieved at a flux of 720 LMH. And this corresponds to only about a 3.8 second residence time in our REM reactor. And these results are attributed to the fact that we're increasing our mass transfer rate. So this is able to uh, increase our overall removal. We're also able to utilize this data to calculate rate constants. And so we are able to calculate a first order rate constant of 210 per hour for PFOS and 607 per hour for PFOA. So once we had provided proof of concept that we could oxidize PFOS compounds in synthetic solutions, we moved on to looking at groundwater samples. So we have two different groundwater samples. The first one is groundwater one. This was obtained from Geosyntec from one of their clients in Jacksonville, Florida. This was generally a PFOS-3 sample. So we spiked this uh, solution with micromolar concentrations of the following six PFOS compounds. And then our second groundwater, uh, we call groundwater two. This was obtained from Wibble Grove Naval Base in collaboration with Jason Spiker. And this had microgram per liter levels of the following five PFOS compounds. And so the general water quality parameters for these two groundwater samples are shown on the left. Uh, key thing for me to point out here is the COD level between these two groundwaters was much higher for, for groundwater one relative to groundwater two. Okay, so the oxidation of groundwater one was first tested as a function of electrode potential and single pass mode. And we utilize a low flux of 60 LMH. And this is corresponded to a residence time of about 45 seconds in the REM. A control experiment was conducted with the open circuit potential, or otherwise OCP, and concentrations were not significantly different than the feed concentration, indicating that measurable absorption of these compounds did not occur. So as the potential increased, the long chain PFOSs, which are shown here, PFNA and PFOS, these were transfer transformed into shorter chain compounds. And in some cases, you can see in the graph here, that our shorter chain compound concentrations exceeded those in the feed concentration. So if we look at the overall removal, the overall PFOS removal, uh, the highest removal we were able to obtain was about 50%, and this corresponded to a moderately high energy consumption. So our energy consumption is given in uh, the metric of EEO, and this is the uh, kilowatt hours per cubic meter of water treated, normalized by the log removal of the compound. So we obtained values between about 13 and 24 uh, in this experiment. And this relatively high um, energy consumption was attributed to the high COD content of the water, which was 43 milligrams per liter. So this suggests that there were uh, numerous competitive reactions at the electrode surface that increased our, our energy consumption. 
So the oxidation of groundwater two was conducted, conducted under similar conditions with a low flux and in single pass mode. Um, in, these, in this experiment, similar results were achieved where long chain PFAS were oxidized to short chain PFAS and total However, a, a lower energy consumption was calculated, and this was about between 11 and 15 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And the lower energy consumption was attributed to having a lower COD background content of only 4.4 milligrams per liter. So this resulted in less competition for reactive sites compared to groundwater one. Since the single pass mode was unable to meet the treatment objective, we tested the REM using a recycle mode with a high flux. So we chose a flux value of 720 LMH, and this corresponded to the highest removal rate that we measured for the PFOA and PFOS in the synthetic solutions. So at the end of this experiment, we were able to achieve greater than 99% total PFOS destruction with individual concentrations less than 61 nanograms per liter. So we were able to get below our goal of 70 nanograms per liter. We also were able to achieve a very low EEO value of only 2.9 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And th therefore these results demonstrate that the high flux in recycle mode was able to decrease the mass transport resistance and therefore was able to achieve our treatment goal. So lastly, I will uh, summarize the EEO calculations. I have given the formula here. Um, this formula has uh, the voltage of the cell, the current of the cell, as well as the flow rate in the reactor. And this is normalized by the log of the permeate concentration, excuse me, the C concentration divided by the permeate concentration. So as we can see in this graph, the first two rows represent the uh, EEO values we obtained in our synthetic solutions in single pass. We're able to, to obtain very low values in this case, but when we move to the groundwater samples, these EEO values increase, which were attributed to the background competition with the background COD. So we move to the recycle mode and we see that we are able to lower our EEO by approximately an order of magnitude and we obtained this very low value of 2.9. So this value of 2.9 is the lowest EEO value uh, in the literature reported for electrochemical oxidation of PFAS, and it's also approximately an order of magnitude lower than most other destructive technologies. So to wrap up the conclusions, we showed that both PFOA and PFOS could be oxidized from milligrams per, per liter levels to nanogram per liter levels in synthetic solutions in a single pass mode. However, when we move to the real groundwater samples, the organic composition of these samples made single pass mode less efficient. So we then moved to a recycle mode, utilizing a high flux and removed PFAS by greater than 99% and all our final individual concentrations were less than 61 nanograms per liter. The energy consumption for this groundwater treatment uh, was calculated at 2.9 kilowatt hours per cubic meter, which is among the lowest reported for electrochemical oxidation. And also our rate constants we reported here, 210 per hour for PFOS, 607 per hour for PFOA. These are among the highest reported in the literature. Sorry about that. And so to wrap up benefits to DOD, this work provides a better understanding of the capabilities of using electrochemical technologies for groundwater remediation. And also we have shown that the REM technology is a low energy destructive technology for PFAS remediation. And so our next steps in this research is to develop a field scale prototype REM for remediation of PFAS contaminated groundwater and to then test that and see the feasibility at a, a real groundwater site. So uh, thanks everyone for their attention. Uh, more information uh, can be found at the website, the project website. And if you have questions, you can also contact me directly by email, 
this is my office number, and of course, I'm not in my office now, so email is the best way to contact me for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for a great presentation. We got a lot of questions coming in for you. Uh, the first one is from the Naval Research Laboratory. Um, how robust are the mum are the membranes during PFAS oxidation? Do their electrochemical properties change with repeated use? And finally, have you investigated any possible sequestration or reaction of the PFAS with the titanium oxide? Okay, I didn't hear the last part of that question. Have you investigated any possible sequestration or reaction of PFAS with the titanium oxide? Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the stability is a very important question for, uh, for uh, use of this material. And so we're looking at this in great detail. The REM materials appear to be very stable during anodic polarization. Um, we have done some work that's shown that the conductivity does decrease with use, but that we're able to regenerate this conductivity by reversing the polarity. So, so briefly, polarizing as a cathode brings back a lot of that. Um, however, there, we still need to do more work on long-term uh, treatment to see, you know, really what the lifetime of these are. But we're investigating that in another sort of project. Um, and actually, what we found uh, is that the REMs seem to be very stable at high potentials, and we're actually having more trouble with the current collectors. And, and so that's actually become one of the challenges that we're trying to address is, is having the current collectors that feed current to the REMs um, to be as stable as the REMs themselves. So yeah, that's a very good question and important topic of research. The last one was related to TiO2. Um, we have utilized TiO2, but not for PFAS. And so the primary reason why we want to convert this to uh, this more conductive phase is that TiO2 is non-conductive, so we need a lot more energy to uh, run the systems for TiO2. We also have, have shown in one of our studies that TiO2 produces far fewer, uh, far lower concentrations of hydroxyl radicals than uh, Ti407. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. This is a question from the Clear Water Fund. Given that some parts of the country are setting um, cleanup levels or guidance values well below EPA's health advisory of 70 nanograms per liter, do you expect to be able to get your technology to deliver lower PFAS concentrations than the uh, values that are being set? Yeah, good question. Um, we expect that that would just be a matter of time. And so it's all about how much time it takes, which corresponds to energy consumption. So I think the, the answer is that, that technically we can achieve that, but on the flip side of that, what is the cost to achieve that? And we haven't uh, gone that far in the research, uh, but I definitely think that we can achieve that, but it's all about whether we can do it cost effectively and, and how does that compare to other technologies? Great, thank you. Uh, this is a question from the Connecticut uh, Agricultural Experiment Station. Uh, rather than the reaction with the hydroxyl radical, is it possible uh, that the PFAS radical cation formed may react with water and then eliminate hydrogen fluoride? Um, yeah, that's another of the mechanisms that uh, have been proposed. I think it's still under debate, um, but I, I believe there has been some work that's shown where people have added quencher to try to uh, eliminate the hydroxyl radicals and still have seen reactivity. So there may be some uh, another pathway to remove these where we can just do the direct oxidation and then reaction with water will will uh, will go on to mineralize that. But yeah, that's still under debate in the literature, uh, but it's definitely an area that people are exploring. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Temple University. As you start thinking about scaling this up, 
or, or uh, piloting it at the, at the um, you know, in the field? What do you believe is a practical upper flow um, flow rate if you are to scale it up? Upper flow rate through the, uh, yeah. Um, I think we're pretty much at the upper flow rates right now. Um, I think what we used was around seven, 720 liters per meter squared per hour. So that is the upper flow rate that we can really achieve with our current porosity. If we go any higher, then we start to have a, too much back pressure and that ends up increasing the cost of pumping. So right now the, the energy requirements that I uh, calculated have the pumping requirements were very, very low in that scenario. So if we go to higher and higher uh, flow rates, then we are going to come into a situation where the pumping becomes uh, a major expense. Thank you, Brian. This is a question from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, did you consider in your studies uh, dissolved minerals in the groundwater competing for oxidation, such as iron oxidation, and increasing the energy consumption for your system? Is this something you looked at? Well, this was a uh, limited scope project, so we had, uh, you know, this represents about uh, 12 months of research. So. We didn't go into that into a great level of detail. Um, if uh, the one who asked that question can go back to slide 30 and look at the um, table of, of groundwater uh, con uh, constituents, we did not have any iron in there. The main problem that we thought that was competing with the re reaction of PFAS was the background COD level. Um, so that still to me seems like the, um, the most important uh, competitive factor in groundwater samples. Another problem that uh, could arise, but it's not really, I, I think, very uh, big of a problem is the scaling on the cathode. So when you have these carbonate species in the solution, you have a high pH on your cathode, and that's going to produce uh, some kind of carbonate scale. But how we envision using this uh, in the field would be that we would have a, uh, both cathode and anode made of this uh, TI-407 material and then we would just periodically change the, the polarity on them. So one of them would be an anode for a period of time. We reverse the polarity, and that would become a cathode for a period of time. And this would effectively uh, dissolve any scale that formed. But yeah, there is a, a lot more work that we need to do here, um, you know, looking at individual constituents in the groundwater and how they impact the performance. So that's a very good question. Thank you, Brian. A question all the way from Australia. Did you account for the energy requirements for recycling the water through the membrane? Uh, yeah, good question. We, we did account for that. It actually comes out to be to a very uh, low percentage of the total energy. I don't remember the exact number, uh, but from recollection on the higher uh, flow rates, uh, I recall it was about 10% or lower of the, of the total energy consumption. And with the low flow rates, it represented uh, maybe, a, maybe a few percent. So it, it was, it's actually pretty small. But if we go to higher and higher fluxes, as I said earlier, that could be uh, a significant contributor to the total energy consumption. All right, Brian, one more question. And we are running out of time for this Q&A session. And we have unanswered questions. So we'll try to get to them, everyone, during the final Q&A. But one uh, last question before we wrap up uh, and move on to Tom. Are, this is a question from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Brian. Are there any plans to test the technology on complex waste streams like landfill leachate or higher COD, BOD groundwater? Sure, yeah, good question. Yeah, we have another uh, project that's funded by EPA where we'll be looking at just, just that, we'll be looking at um, municipal wastewater side streams as well as landfill leachates and I think those two um, two solutions are going to be uh, they appear to be the most uh, complicated to treat and you can imagine all the different compounds that are present in there that can uh, interfere with the PFAS reaction and so that uh, work is very early on and uh, you know we've been grounded here for a bit and out of our lab now so hopefully this summer and the fall, we can get back to that research and have some key results uh, to share with the community. 
Thank you so much, Brian, for an excellent presentation and, and a phenomenal Q&A session here. We're going to go ahead and transition to our second speaker for today, who is Dr. Thomas Holson. Tom is the Jean S. Noel Distinguished Professor in Engineering and Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at Clarkson University. He is also the Director of the Clarkson Center for Air and Aquatic Resources Engineering and Sciences. Uh, Tom's primary research interests include the trans transport, transformations, fate and treatment um, of legacy and emerging contaminants. He is a board certified environmental engineering member of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists, and he earned his doctoral degree in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Tom, please proceed. Tom, you may be on mute. We cannot hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So I'd like to start by thanking my collaborators at Clarkson University, GSI Environmental, and ECT2, and noting that more complete acknowledgments will be made at the end of the presentation. So my presentation will start with a brief review of project objectives followed by soil washing methods, materials, and results. This will be followed by an overview of plasma treatment, followed by overall results, conclusions, and DOD benefits. So the overall project objective is to investigate soil washing of investigation-derived waste, or IDW, followed by treatment of soil washing solution in an enhanced contact plasma reactor to destroy desorbed PFAS. This was a limited scope proposal that is just ending now. So soil washing methods are shown in this slide, and I want to point out one important thing. The soil was dried, pulverized and tumbled end over end, so mass transfer limitations were largely eliminated. The IDW samples we used in our experiments were obtained from four sites courtesy of GSI Environmental. Total PFAS concentrations in some of the IDW were up to several thousand micrograms per kilogram. Concentrations varied significantly between samples and also across compounds. Soil properties, including pH, anion exchange capacity, and organic carbon content also varied. For most of my presentation, I'll show results from the Jacksonville IDW, which had the highest organic carbon content, one of the highest anion exchange capacities, and in general, the poorest removals. So the hypothesis we based our soil washing work on was that PFAS, PFAS were sorbed to soil by a combination of hydrophobic sorption, and ion exchange mechanisms. We therefore examined a combination of water, methanol, and salt to remove PFAS from soil, similar to what has been shown to be successful for regenerable ion exchange resin. So the result slides generally follow the layout I've shown here. The y-axis is the mass removed from the soil, and the x-axis is the variable investigated. In this case, we looked at how much the amount of methanol in the wash solution impacted removal. The blue bars show that no salt show results with no salt, and the orange bars show results with 1% NaCl by weight. As you can see, the addition of methanol increased removal for both PFOS and PFOA. Although I am showing results for only these two compounds, we did analyze for a broad suite of compounds. In general, PFOS proved to be one of the most difficult compounds to remove. Statistically, across all the compounds we analyzed for, and across all the IDWs, the highest removal occurred with a mixture of 50-50 methanol and water. We also investigated how salt content impacted removal using 50-50 DI methanol, water, methanol solution and found that 1% sodium chloride by weight was optimal. For some compounds in some of the IDWs, 5% percent 
Tony employed had better removal, but the improvements were not statistically significant. For the 50-50 DI methanol 1% sodium chloride solution, we also compared removal to those obtained using more traditional techniques, for example, using other solvents, including methanol and ammonium hydroxide, changing pH, and sonication, and found no statistical difference in the removal amounts. Slide 46. We also found that removal is fast on the order of minutes. But let me remind you that this was for pulverized soil. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to one slide. Here we go. The 50-50 DI methanol 1% sodium chloride solution. This slide seems to be slightly out of order. Impact of soil washes. So we saw, as you can see in this slide, we found that 90% of the of the PFAS was moved in the first wash, with lesser amounts moved in washes two and three. And kinetics were fast. We found removal was on the order of minutes. But let me remind you that this was for pulverized soil tumbled end over end, so mass transfer limitations were minimized. We also carried out some experiments for several weeks and found little or no additional removal compared to what we saw in the first couple hours. So the overview of soil washing results. Shown here, water alone removed a large amount of PFAS. For short chain PFAS, water alone is generally as effective as the other washes. Increasing methanol content up to 50% methanol resulted in better removal. Salt addition increased removal However, there was little difference between 1 and 5% NaCl by weight. The vast majority of the PFAS were removed in the first wash. Removal of PFAS was fast. It took us minutes, not hours, to remove the majority of the compounds. And finally, pH had a minor impact on PFAS removal, although I did not show those data today. So let me now turn to plasma treatment results. For these experiments, since we did not have much soil washing solution, since we only used very small vials in our soil washing experiments, and in practice, methanol would likely be recovered in, through distillation before any plasma treatment, we therefore used lab prepared solutions and still bottoms from ion exchange regenerate solutions we obtained from ECT2 to simulate soil washing solutions after methanol recovery. So plasmas are formed when voltage applied between two electrodes is high enough to cause gas in the space between two electrodes to become a cloud of ions, electrons, and neutral species. In our reactors, plasma is formed using a high voltage discharge generated by charging a bank of capacitors and discharging it through a rotating spark cap. The discharge produces a very rich chemistry, as shown on the right-hand side of this figure, including reductive species like aqueous electrons. Plasma discharge is unique compared to advanced oxidation processes in, in that it is both a reductive and oxidative technology. In our reactors, we concentrate PFAS at the gas water interface using bubbles produced by diffusers so the PFAS are near the discharge. So we've scaled up the process from a small laboratory reactor shown on the left hand side of this figure to a larger reactor which we've tested in the field. Last summer at a AFFF fire training area, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, in an ASCAP project teamed up with GSI Environmental. Going forward, in collaboration with GSI, we have received funding from the National Defense Center for Energy and Environment and the U.S. Army Environmental Command and ESTCP to perform several field demonstrations for a variety of PFAS impacted waters and with Wood Environmental and ACT2 to treat still bottoms produced from regenerable ion exchange media. So this slide shows the schematic of the reactor we used in these experiments. A high voltage sawtooth electrode was placed above the water, and the diffuser was in the bottom of the reactor at a depth of approximately 1.5 centimeters. The water volume was approximately 1.5 liters. We used approximately 400 watts 
In these experiments, cool them to a small hair dryer, indicating that plasma process is very energy efficient. In preliminary experiments containing PFOA in a high brine solution, the starting concentration of 110 milligrams per liter, shown on the y-axis, was reduced to near detection limits, tens of nanograms per liter, in about 50 minutes. Shorter chain PFAA, as shown on the right-hand side of this figure, uh, were produced and then destroyed with an accumulation of PFBA at the end of the experiment. These results are similar to those shown in our recent publications for non-brine solutions, where long-chain PFAAs are broken down to shorter and shorter-chain PFAAs. Significant amounts of fluoride are found in the water after treatment, generally accounting for about 70% of the theoretical amount. The poor removal of short-chain PFAAs is because they are not concentrated as readily at the gas-water interface by bubbling as our longer-chain PFAAs. This slide shows removal of PFAAs from actual still bottom samples. The left hand graph shows how good removal of water shows good removal of longer chain PFAs. And the right hand graph shows slower removal of short chain PFAAs. This slower removal was enhanced in these experiments because they are produced by the breaking down of longer chain precursors. As I just mentioned, precursors were removed during treatment and partially converted to PFAAs, which are then removed. Unidentified precursors were also present in very high concentration in the sample, as TOP was approximately 50 milligrams per liter, and the highest concentration of identified precursors was only approximately 4 milligrams per liter. The TOP concentration was also significantly reduced in these experiments. So as I just mentioned, precursors, excuse me. Uh, so to address removal of short chain PFAs, we recently performed some experiments in which we added cationic surfactant to, to, to PFBS containing solution. The surfactant associated with the PFBS through a combination of hydrophobic and electrostoric interactions and bubbling brought the PFBS surfactant combination to the surface where it was destroyed by the plasma. The surfactant C tab, being a hydrocarbon, was also rapidly removed. I think this may be an efficient way to remove short chain PFAA if that is important for a particular site. So, an overview of the plasma treatment results plasma treatment of brine solutions is effective at destroying PFAS. In general, longer chain PFAS are removed more efficiently than shorter chain PFAS. Precursors present in soil washing solution will extend the required treatment times, although we are currently exploring ways to pre-oxidize precursors before plasma treatment to shorten the times required. And finally, plasma treatment is relatively insensitive to salt concentration in the presence of small amounts of methanol. Those data are not shown, were not shown today. So overall conclusions. Soil washing with methanol plus sodium chloride is effective at removing PFAS from soil, although water alone is fairly effective, especially for short-chain PFAS in low organic carbon content soils. PFAS are removed quickly from soils. It only took us minutes in these experiments where our last mass transfer limitations were eliminated. As material to destroy PFAS in high concentration salt solutions is effective, and precursor concentrations are an important determinant of required plasma treatment times. Precursor oxidation before plasma treatment would decrease treatment times and may be economically beneficial. So benefits to DOD. A significant amount of PFAS containing IDW will be generated in the coming years. An on-site method combined, on-site desorption method combined with the destruction treatment technology would decrease IDW to solar costs and limit DOD future liability associated with PFAS going off-site. So to finish up with some acknowledgments, uh, more detailed acknowledgments at Clarkson University, I'd like to thank Selma 
Taggart Medvedevich and Michelle Crimi, co PIs on this project, and the people that did all the hard lab work, Justin Maselli, Sujan Fernando, and Raj Singh, the GSI Environmental, Steve Richardson and Punam Kalkarni for helping get the IDW samples, at ECT2, Steve Woodard and Mike Nicholson for supplying the still bottom samples, and I'd like to thank Andrea Leeson and her team for funding of this work and setting up this webinar. So additional information can be found here, as, as well as by contacting me at this contact information. We're working on some publications. They should be coming shortly. Thank you so much, Tom. We have received a number of questions. The first one is from Purdue University. Um, how did sodium chloride um, affect colloid dispersion during washing? during soil washing? Were colloids in the spent wash solution measured? No, we didn't measure colloid concentrations. Um, and colloids don't really impact plasma removal because plasma is based on bubbling. So we bubble actually argon gas through the water to bring the PFAS to the surface. Um, so if anything that stays in the back in the bulk water doesn't impact our removal. Thank you. This is a question from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, what interferences did you experience, in, if any, from the suspended solids in the solution that you are treating? Yeah, as I just mentioned, our, our process is based on the surfactant-like qualities of PFAS, which allows us to separate them from the bulk water and bring them near the plasma discharge. Uh, so other co-contaminants that aren't surfactant-like don't impact plasma removal in general. Great. Thank you, Tom. And to follow up on this, uh, this is a question from the Air Force Research Laboratory. Uh, you, you, you mentioned this a little bit, but can you elaborate on the mechanism of sorption and desorption of PFAS? So PFAS are sorbed to soil by a combination of hydrophobic interactions with the organic carbon content, and also the charged heads of the PFAS molecules can participate in ion exchange type uh, sorption or electrostatic sorption. So to effectively remove PFAS from soil, you have to both uh, eliminate the hydrophobic effects and the electrostatic interactions. That's why we use a combination of salt and methanol um, to eliminate those two associations. Thank you, Tom. This is a question from Shell. How does plasma treatment compare to activated tri uh, carbon treatment and subsequent um, carbon incineration or disposal from the perspective uh, of cost and energy usage? Use That's a question, a good question and something we're working hard on. Energy requirements for plasma is actually quite low. In our field study um, at the Wright-Patterson Air, Air, Air Force Base, energy requirements were about uh, 0 0.07 uh, dollars, sorry, cents per gallon, quite low. Um, that doesn't include labor costs and, and equipment. Um, I think the big advantage of plasma treatment over carbon is carbon has to be disposed of off-site. Uh, so our treatment technology allows PFAS to remain on-site and eliminate any future liability. Thank you, Tom. That's a really great point. Um, a question from Temple University. For the soil washing experiments, what was the ratio you used of soil uh, to washing solution? Uh, we generally used a, up to five grams of soil and up to 50 milliliters of wash solution. Thank you. Another question from Temple University. Uh, did you try washing the soil as received from the site? And if so, was there any significant difference compared to the pulverized soil test? No, another good question. No, we did not uh, treat any soil as received. I think that hope hopefully will be future funding and future work 
to look at more realistic soil conditions. Great. Um, assuming that your technology is going to become commercially available, um, when when would that uh, be? Do you have a timeline for taking this to field and making it uh, widely available? Uh, as I mentioned, we have several field demonstrations planned uh, over the next year or so. Uh, so that should give us enough information to be able to scale this up to realistic, realistic treatment volumes. Thank you. Um, the questions are coming in so fast; it's hard to keep up. Uh, will uh, what? Do, do you have an idea yet about the cost for plasma treatment? We've gotten about three questions about this, so I know you're in the middle of your demonstrations, but in terms of uh, cost, can you give us some relative estimates? Uh, that's a question we're working hard on. As I mentioned, our energy requirements out at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base this summer, where we treated several hundred gallons of IDW Earth groundwater, we were at 0.7 cents per gallon for energy only, including pumping and plasma. And on top of that, we'd have to include labor costs and equipment costs. Thank you. Um, what are some of the byproducts uh, from the plasma treatment? And there's a question related to this specific to the hydrogen fluoride that you're uh, possibly generating and whether you're uh, capturing that and whether there are any impacts to, to air quality. There's three questions in there, Tom. Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Uh, and that is a great question. We recently published a paper in Environmental Science and Technology addressing byproducts, so I encourage anyone interested to look at that paper. But in general, longer chain PFAS are broken down into shorter chain PFAS, eventually fluoride ions, inorganic carbon. We see some smaller organic acids like trifluoroacetic acid and formic acid formed. Uh, we generally see between 50 and 70 percent of the theoretical amount of fluoride ion produced. Uh, we do see some sorption on reactors, which makes it difficult to close the mass balance completely. Uh, as far as gas phase byproducts, we recycle the argon completely, so it's a sealed system. And that argon is continually uh, exposed to the plasma, so any gas phase byproducts are also broken down. Uh, hydrogen fluoride concentrations, uh, we haven't measured those in the gas phase, but the concentrations are extremely low. Um, in the um, concentration of PFAS in the water is quite low, so the amount of theoretical hydrogen fluoride produced is also generally pretty low. Thank you so much, Tom. At this point, I'd like to bring uh, Brian back in, and uh, we'll try and ask you some uh questions that you can both answer, and then we'll go back and try and answer uh, questions for you and uh, Brian that we did not have the chance to get to. Um, so based on both of your work, and we'll start with you, Brian, would you recommend the treatment train approach to better manage PFAS uh, impacts to soil and groundwater okay, and also IDW? Yeah, good question. Um, the treatment train approach uh, could have, uh, I guess, several benefits. Um, as, as everyone who's working in this area knows, that uh, the concentrations that are present in groundwater are usually at the highest in the microgram per liter range, and we have to achieve very low uh, removal. So a pre-concentration step uh, could be an effective uh, method to, uh, to treat these, uh, these compounds. And so that could be done through uh, a sorbent uh, pre-concentration step or a membrane pre-concentration step. And so we're actually looking at the latter in one of our projects, um, but it's really too early to kind of uh, to know the cost of these things. But that very well could be a, a very good approach of pre-concentrating it and then running that concentrated solution to, a, um, to an electrochemical or even plasma technology. 
Thank you, Brian. Tom, what is your opinion on a treatment train approach for managing PFAS impacts? Yeah, may may be very beneficial. In fact, we have a sort of project uh, right now that we're part of looking at at different treatment trains, uh, including plasma treating low concentration water, plasma treating and exchange regenerate solutions to the bottoms. Um, And certainly another option would be plasma before traditional treatment, like plasma before activated carbon, extending the life of activated carbon is another option. So those are all things we're exploring. Great, thank you. Another question for you both. Um, Both of you alluded to uh, PFOS, PFOA, but also some of the shorter chain compounds. And you concluded that the shorter chain compounds are much more difficult to destroy than than the eight carbon chain PFOS and PFOA. Um, Based on your experience with these two projects, how will this influence IDW management and treatment? Brian, we'll start with you. Yeah, this is a good question. So um, the kinetics of the short chain compounds uh, seem to be lower in, in, in both our talks that we showed. And this is a general trend across the literature as well. Um, so I think what this will ultimately do is it's going to define uh, what we need to do in terms of treatment. So that's going to mean that the shorter chain compounds uh, need to be eliminated, and we have to design our remediation systems to achieve uh, most likely complete mineralization. And so what this means is it's going to increase the time for reaction that in turn is going to increase the operational cost. Thank you, uh, Brian. Tom, would you like uh, to add to this? Oh, uh, Sure. So our, our process relies on being able to get the uh, PFAS compounds to the gas water interface. And since the shorter chain compounds are less hydrophobic, they're more difficult to get to that, that interface. Uh, we've, as I mentioned, come up with uh, sort of fact an addition that may help with that process. Um, but if you do want to remove short chains, uh, it definitely will take longer, more time. Great, thank you. Uh, you also uh, mentioned the potential for byproduct formation from both of your technologies. Can you elaborate on ways to manage this should you scale up your technologies? And we'll start with you, Brian. Okay, yeah, good question. Uh, so this is, of course, an area that we're looking into. Um, that, so what we found from our uh, TI-407 electrodes is they actually have uh, a low activity for uh, chloride oxidation. So this is one of the, uh, the, the problems associated with electrochemical oxidation in general, that they can form both chlorinated organics as well as inorganic byproducts. And so we've been looking at this, and it appears in single pass mode that, that the byproduct formations are quite low. However, as you've seen we, in, in my talk, we had to move to recycle mode where the formation of these products could be uh, a higher concern. Um, so what we, our approach to handle this is we're working on, on different cathode materials that will allow us to reduce these uh, different halogenated products that may form. And so far we've, we've been uh, seeing very good results for that. So it's possible that one approach to this would be having a downstream cathode. And so any, uh, for example, any coordinated organic products or coordinated inorganic products that form on the anode would then be able to be reduced on the cathode. So that's kind of how we're looking at uh, solving that problem. Great. And Tom, what about for plasma-based technologies? How do you plan to address this? Yeah, it's an ongoing area of research and something we've looked at pretty closely. Um, In general, it's it's the shorter chain alkyl acid they could produce. And um, I think we have a strategy to to remove them. Uh, And this would be another case where a treatment train approach might be applicable, where you put something like activated carbon or something else downstream of the plasma treatment to remove any potential byproducts. Wonderful. That was a question, by the way, from Duke University. All right, next question. Um, We've got this universe of thousands of PFAS compounds and 
only tens that are uh, that we're able to measure, and even a smaller number that is being considered for regulation or is already regulated by some of the states. So, um, when it comes to your work and your treatment for technologies, uh, what role do the unidentified PFAS and precursors play in the treatment scenarios that you described? And we'll start with Brian again. Okay, yeah, good question. So um, yeah, a lot of what uh, we've been working on so far, it's been fairly uh, well characterized solutions. So like you said, there are thousands of, of these different compounds. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of um, analytical approach, it, it, it's necessary, you know, to, to at least characterize the total organic fluorine content and to characterize how much is removed in the process. That's because it's very difficult to measure all of these. But in terms of how they're going to impact the, the uh, treatment of maybe the ones that we're, we're aware of or, or have regulations set, um, they will have a competitive effect, definitely at the electrode surface. Um, and so uh, it's my thought really though that all of these compounds are going to be found to be toxic and eventually perhaps they all will be regulated. So really uh, the way we look at this is uh, we, our goal is really to mineralize all of the organic fluorine compounds that are present. Thank you, Brian. And Tom? Yeah, I, I agree with Brian. I think um, the PFAS community regulators, researchers have to come to grips with this broad suite of compounds, not just focus on, on the ones we're typically used to looking at. Um, Plasma, our process doesn't distinguish between PFAS types. It just it uh, works on the hydrophobicity, so it destroys anything that gets to the air-water interface. As we've shown in our in our results, um, precursors get broken down, produce the alkyl acids, and then those get uh, broken down as well. Um, so our process doesn't distinguish between them. But I think the the bigger question is is as a community how we how are we going to handle this broad suite of compounds? Great. Thank you both. Um, another big picture question that's come in has to do with all the um, attention being given to incineration lately in the news, um, with incineration being a method that we're relying on to destroy PFAS. Um, have you tried to compare your destructive processes um, to incineration from one, an effectiveness point of view, and two, um, you know, co you know, cost effectiveness also? Uh, Brian? Yeah, good question. Uh, we haven't uh, actually dug into the details of incineration in terms of uh, costs and things like that. But I do recall, uh, I'm not sure if this was in a paper or a, a news article, I did recently see that uh, a study came out that suggested that incineration is actually not destroying these compounds and they're actually just uh, scattering them in, back into the environment. Um, I don't know all the details of that, so I don't want to say too much more uh, about that study, but I did remember seeing that. So if that is the case, then in fact that uh, what's happening in incineration might be just spreading the compounds back into the environment in a diffuse sense. And so that can be a big concern. But yeah, we haven't looked at the, the costs uh, at this point yet. That is something that we have planned to do in the future of trying to, to see how they compare on a both energy and, and cost basis. Great, thank you. And Tom? Yeah, like, like Brian, we haven't looked too closely at this. Um, it's kind of hard to get costs for offset incineration, at least we haven't been successful in doing that. We think we are cost competitive um, on cost alone, but, but as Brian said, I think there's a lot of questions about incineration and what happens to, uh, downstream of incineration with off gases as they cool. And certainly there's liability associated with transporting waste off site, um, which is hard to, hard to quantify, but, but a real cost uh, potentially. So uh, on site, Treatment technologies, I think, would have a, a big advantage when, when PFAS waste doesn't have to move off-site. 
Great. Thank you both for taking so many questions. We have a lot of detailed questions specific to your technology. So I'd like to encourage our audience members to reach out to you directly, given the information that was um, provided by you in your slides for those types of questions. We got a comment about taking advantage of this um, uh, today's great speakers to discuss the toxicity mechanisms of the PFAS compounds that were described. Um, our experts today are focused on destructive treatment technologies. If you are interested in learning more about PFAS, I would really encourage you to go to the link that Andrea discussed and to access it for uh, resources specific to PFAS toxicology. Also, we did have a webinar um, last month uh, that focused on uh, PFAS toxicity mechanisms and um, its research that was done at Purdue University as well as a guidance document um, on uh, with levels, um, with recommended levels for ecological uh, risk assessment. So fantastic resources on the PFAS um, resources page that uh, Andrea referred to. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead, thank our um, phenomenal speakers and wrap up. But before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that we do have a webinar in two weeks. It is in the Resource Conservation and Resiliency Program on May 21st. And this webinar will focus um, on innovative modeling tools to analyze ecosystem services on Department of Defense lands and uh, installations. We'll also have the presenters, uh, Dr. Nate McDowell from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory will talk about his startup funded work to develop a framework for evaluating management alternatives for different ecosystem services, as well as predicting their impacts on climate and the environment. And then Dr. Mark Borosak uh, from Duke University will talk about his third funded research on applying a computational assessment tool to document the value that military bases provide to local communities in the form of ecosystem services. So registration is open uh, for this webinar and other webinars in the startup ESCCP webinar series. So please go to the um, webpage uh, for our webinars and register for this and um, other ones coming up. And before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on the startup and ESCCP webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would really appreciate it this time if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your time.